Today on Marketing Mavericks, I talk with Rob Lynch, who's the head of marketing at Arby's, Lynette Young, and Bob North, all about Amazon cart, Facebook advertising, big data, and the ROI of the single tweet. Coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Marketing Mavericks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Welcome to Marketing Mavericks, the intersection of marketing and technology where we talk about everything that's happening on the web as it relates to marketing and how we're using social media, how brands are engaging with the latest and greatest in software. We've got um, a few guests joining us this morning, including the chief marketing officer for RBs, Rob Lynch. Then we're going to be joined by a couple of my favorite marketing people, Lynette Young and Bob Norb, whose birthday is today. We'll be sure to talk more about that. So our first guest is Rob Lynch, the Brand President and Chief Marketing Officer at Arby's. Thanks for joining Hi, us Hi. this morning. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Fancy looking headset you got there. Yeah. Where'd you get that? <laughs> Some, a good friend of mine gave it to me and asked me to wear it on the show. Because you look very professional. I just want to get that out of the way. So you're new at Arby's, really. I mean, you joined, uh, it's not quite been a year. What, September of last year, you joined Arby's. A lot has happened. Yeah, it's been about about seven months. And yeah, a lot has happened. We've had uh, a lot of fun in the last seven months. And and including um, the Grammys uh, social media uh, incident where you had, um, I call it an incident, but it's actually um, was a really great opportunity that you took advantage of where you um, engaged with the Pharrell hat. You guys actually have the Pharrell hat. Are we going to see that on the show today? We are. I'm, I'm going to save that for dessert. Um, you know, maybe towards the end of our show, uh, we can we can show you how the hat is is living here at Arby's. The fair enough, fair enough. I keep asking to see it, but you know, I actually would love to see it on you. So in place of the headset, that's the only replacement for the headset would be the hat. So um, Arby's is a brand that's been around since 1964. You've uh, you've recently joined a. a a brand that's got an established customer base. Haven't really seen, uh, from my end, a lot of dramatic changes over the years. But, but you know, we were talking about this before the show started. You've got some pretty healthy options, actually, on the Arby's menu. And I think, I guess, my question for you would be, what is the Arby's brand? Is it fast food? Is it healthy option? I mean, where's what is the Arby's brand? Sure. Well, you know, I think um, a lot of marketers tend to tell you what the Arby's or what their brand is. And I tend to talk to our customers and, and, and define the brand based on what they uh, believe the brand to be. And what we found um, with Arby's is we've got a brand where we've been around for, this year's actually our 50th anniversary. So Arby's has been around a long time. And we've got a lot of very loyal customers who love what we do um, every day. And they come in and they they um, they love, you know, the food that we serve. They love the service that we provide. Um, we kind of live in this space that lives between, call it, uh, QSR and kind of a more traditional sandwich shop where um, we offer a lot of different products that uh, you can't find at a traditional QSR. Uh, however, despite that, um, what we've what when I got here, the first thing I did was seek to understand what our customers think of us, and wholeheartedly and without um, you know variance, they think of Arby's as roast beef. They think of Arby's as a place that you go when you uh, want a roast beef sandwich. And what we have you know done over the last six months is really build a foundation that allows us to go beyond just a great roast beef sandwich, a, a, a product platform and an innovation pipeline that allows us to offer a variety of different types of um, great food and great sandwiches that will appeal not just to our current customers who come to us for primarily for roast beef, but to a whole new generation of customers that um, are really predisposed to love the kind of food that Arby's has the right to offer. So great sandwiches with 
um, you know, great proteins like, you know, turkey and um, barbecue brisket and some of the other um, more innovative and upstream things that we're currently exploring. So we've had a great run over the last um, six or seven months. You know, the first day I got here was the first day of the uh, new smokehouse brisket sandwich. And that product and that, 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 um, that food and that great innovation, it was really the foundation on which we're building. It really took uh, for the first time, took the brand to a new space where we actually saw a lot of new customers coming in to try something other than our traditional roast beef sandwiches, and they loved it. And we saw unprecedented amount of um, engagement with the brand uh, on the social level as well as in our restaurants. People coming up who had never been in Arby's before and saying, wow, I didn't know Arby's had these types of uh, this type of food. So we tried to build on that, and in the last uh, six or seven months, we've we've really built a foundation to to move forward with our product platforms and our innovation pipeline. Um, we've also been in the news, as you know, as you mentioned, with the whole uh, Arby's hat when Pharrell wore that on the Grammys, and that that is a great story, and, and it, it's kind of a marketer's dream. We're all things- and I and I want to get I want to get to that, but before you do, I want to stick to this idea of. Um, a healthy menu and how you educate people, because I would agree with you when I think of Arby's, especially before really looking into um, having you as a guest on the show and and being really excited about you joining. I mean, I think I asked you to be on the show, like the, literally the week that you were announced that you uh, you were you were joining the Arby's team. And, and you know, I've given you time. And so I finally got you on. Right. Uh, but um, but it's this idea of I always thought of Arby's as a roast beef sandwich. So how do you educate, reeducate people um, and what technology are you using? I mean, so, okay, first question, who's your target customer? Is it the millennials? Is it, you know, um, baby boomers? Who's your target? Well, we define our target as the people who are, are predisposed to, to love the type of food that we offer. So the people who have, um, you know, values and core beliefs and affinities for the types of products and the type of food that, that, that we're, we serve today as well as that we intend on serving in the future. So we call our target audience the 10 gallon hearts. They are the folks who come into our restaurants and they, they eat at a lot of um, QSR you know restaurants, but um, they come to Arby's primarily because they love the warmth of, of the food that we serve. You know, we serve sandwiches, but for the most part, they're, they're, they're hot sandwiches. Um, and we serve it in a way that makes people feel almost as if they're at home. You know, I talk about it a lot um, here at, at Arby's that it, it, Taco Bell, while I was there, you know, Taco Bell has a great thing going and they're doing great work. Um, but their focus is on being authentically cool. They want to be cool to appeal to a millennial customer. Um, here at Arby's, we almost we almost want to be the opposite. We want to be warm. We want to be the kind of brand and the kind of friend that our customers can come and feel comfortable with, that they um, can be themselves and we can be ourselves and we can connect together over great food. So that that type of mindset, that type of um, you know way that we market to our customers really spans, you know, generational and demographic um, segments. So we don't specifically say, hey, we're going after the millennial. We're going after, you know, teens. We're, go- we're going after a type of person, a person who um, wants great food at a great value served in a way that makes them feel like they're, they could be in their, their you know, kids kitchen at home, um, warm, welcoming, and friendly. So that's that's how we, that's the environment we try to create. And those are the customers we try to go after that, that value that type of environment and that type of food. So, okay, you mentioned the Pharrell hat, which, um, you know, the minute I say Pharrell, I, the song Happy just starts going through my head and um, I still like it. So, because um, it does make me happy. But um, you guys, you guys really capitalized on an opportunity there. Your social media person, um, tweeted out a, an excellent tweet. It was one tweet that really led to a lot of attention for Arby's. It's kind of that moment every brand wants, right? Oreo's done a good job of it in the past. And we talk about Oreo over and over again, but other brands that do a great job too. But Arby's, you guys captured a moment 
And and then you bought the hat, as, as we've talked about. But so what's the ROI on that? I mean, one tweet, did you see a jump in sales? Are people rushing to Arby's to get a roast beef sandwich or a healthy menu item? How, how do you measure the success of one tweet? Well, you know, you mentioned Oreo, and I think, you know, Oreo, the dunk in the dark tweet during the Super Bowl has been held up as the gold standard for a long, for, you know, since that happened last year. Um, and I think they got about 35,000 retweets in the first 24 hours. Um, you know, this, this whole extravaganza happened as a result of our, our manager of social media was actually at home, um, making a bottle for his baby <laughs> and watching the Grammys. And he, tr you know, he obviously stays really connected and he was tracking the conversations that were happening about our brand during this, this huge, uh, pop culture event as the Grammys. And he, he saw that when Pharrell came on and, and wearing that hat, that there was a lot of conversations, um, about, you know, oh, you know, that hat actually looks like the Arby's hat. So it actually stemmed from listening to our customers and what they were saying and what they were thinking about. And so he took it upon himself to tweet out from Arby's to directly to Pharrell. Uh, um, can we have our hat back? <laughs> and, uh, you know, obviously hashtagged it, hashtag Grammys. And that just lit the fuse. So, the you know, the wonderful thing about this is that in the first 24 hours, we received over 85,000 tweets or retweets. And it, it really boosted the conversation about our brand. And, you know, back to the original question, you know, you, you mentioned when I first got here, Arby's is a brand with a ton of heritage and a ton of awareness, but a low level of engagement. For, for whatever reason, over the last, you know, 10 to 15 years, Arby's has kind of fallen out of the conversation. And, you know, we still have our loyal customers, um, but we haven't had a, a lot of success bringing new customers in. We haven't been in the conversation. And, you know, this, this obviously we have our strategic pillars and we have all the work that we're doing to, around our food to create um, reasons for customers to come in and engage with our brand. But this sparked a conversation about Arby's that we're not used to seeing here. Um, we got, you know, coverage by media platforms and different, um, you know, celebrities type, you know, uh, talking about our brand that we frankly hadn't seen in the, in the brand's history. And so, um, it, it, it really started a lot of conversations here about, okay, this is great, but what do we do with it and how do we leverage it? And, you know, having some, you know, a fair amount of experience in, in the social media space and working with great folks here, we came to the conclusion that we, we obviously wanted to make this as big as it possibly could, but we wanted to do it in an Arby's way, which is an authentic way. We didn't want to all of a sudden have, you know, Pharrell's hat in all of our commercials. We didn't want to um, start, you know, overusing it because my belief when it comes to social media is that it is an engagement medium. It is not an advertising medium. It's a way for us to have a dialogue with our customers. And in order for anyone to want to talk to someone else, it has to be interesting and it has to be authentic and it has to be meaningful. You wouldn't walk up to someone who you're trying to be friends with and start telling them all about what you do and why they should, you know, buy things from you or anything like that. You would you would do it in a way that makes them feel like um, you're you're somebody that they want to be associated with, somebody that they could learn to care about. Yeah. And so, that, well, you know, I, but I have to say, I mean, that is that does require engagement. You said that, that you haven't engaged a lot in the past, and you've also said that Scott, you guys thinking about how you want to move forward. What are you going to do moving forward to engage more? I mean, clearly this was an eye opener. What's next? So, I mean, I think we will continue to look at the right and appropriate ways to engage with our customers. I mean, we do, we, do, we, we leverage the medium in a, probably a more commercial way. Um, we, you know, we send out obviously a lot of information about, you know, what we're promoting and, and on, at any given time. Um, we try to engage with our core audience in ways that they, uh, think are relevant and meaningful. So, you know, for St. Patrick's day, we were featuring our, uh, our Reuben sandwich, which is obviously a corned beef sandwich. And, you know, Corned beef is a tradition, traditionally an Irish 
um, uh, protein. So we felt like there was a tie there. And so we went and we did a, um, a big program where we gave away free Rubens in Shamrock, Texas, um, as a part of our promotion. And we, we really promoted that through the social space. Uh, we didn't go out and create a television ad about it. We, we did it in a way that we thought would be authentic and relevant for our core target audience. Um, so there, there's a fine line between creating content and creating, um, engagement opportunities and overplaying that and turning it into a sales pitch. So we try to walk that fine line and make sure that we're doing it in the most authentic and appropriate way. Ford Motors done a really good job of, um, you know, launching new products using social media. Scott Monty is a, a good example of a brand ambassador who really gets how to kind of leverage the social space with traditional marketing. And, you know, we all have marketing budgets and we all look at, okay, where are we going to put our time, attention and dollars? Um, and you guys have franchise owners. So how does, how do you encourage the franchise owners and the franchises to take part in social or participate in the marketing? I mean, is that something that you encourage them to do? I mean, I didn't, I mean, I, I, you know, the Rubens, I think you guys brought one, but I mean, does, do people really know, you know, at, at a local level, unless you do something kind of grassroots like you did? Well, the first step in getting the franchisees engaged was uh, when I got here to Arby's, the first thing I did was build a social listening room. So I built, you know, built out a room where we were um, able to go in as a team and watch all the conversations that were going on about our brand, about the industry, about competition in real time and, and engage with our customers in real time and, and, and monitor and track those conversations. So I brought in our franchisee group and our board of directors and showed them this, this capability and they were blown away. They didn't realize that um, there was this ability to um, in not just you know not just track the conversations and seek to understand and learn you know what what customers are are saying about us, but also to engage with them. And so when we brought them in and we showed them you know the, uh, a, a, a comment, a tweet that came across um, came up on screen that minute, and we were able to type something back to them and engage in a conversation with them in real time, it blew them away. And so they obviously um, got a sense of, of what the capability could do. And that was before the whole Pharrell tweet blew up. So once, once they, they understood we had this capability and once they saw the output of, of dedicating ourselves to, tra to, to engaging with our customers in this way, it, it really became very easy to help them um, become partners in building out this platform and building out this capability because they saw the results. And so our business right now is incredibly healthy. Um, you know, we are outpacing the QR our industry fairly significantly. And we're not doing, we haven't yet implemented all of the innovation that we're working on or even the new kind of branding um, advertising campaign that, that we're working on. It really... We're, 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 we believe that a lot of the out over outperformance of the industry has to do with this engagement, with this social media um, investment that we've made and the output from that. So um, everyone here is completely on board. We've, we're actually uh, staffing up the team that, that leads our social platform. And, um, you know, it's definitely a part of our marketing model moving forward. Hey, everybody, Arby's is hiring. So if, you, <laughs> if you're looking for a, a cool gig, I think Rob would be a great guy to work for. Um, you, you mentioned Taco Bell has a different strategy and their approach towards social media and, and using technology to engage consumers is different. Who's your competition? Well, you know, they're different in, 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 in how they're positioning their brand. But they are um, innovators in, in how they activate their brand um, from a you know, music standpoint, uh, from a, you know, a social standpoint, from an engagement standpoint. And so we don't necessarily – we're not trying to uh, reinvent the model. They've done a good job. We're excited about our ability to, um, you know, to continue to, to build our platform. I'd say our competition um, – Taco Bell is definitely a competitor. Uh, McDonald's is a competitor. But we also – view um, a lot of the newer concepts, the new sandwich concepts that are hitting the market um, is our competition as well. And because, as I mentioned, our goal is to kind of straddle the um, QSR and fast casual slash um, 
sandwich segments. And so we can deliver the convenience and the speed and the value associated with QSR, but with products and platforms and food and innovation that would traditionally only be found in a more premium type sandwich shop. So we look, we have a very broad spectrum of who we compete against, but we, we feel like we almost have carved out a unique niche that um, allows us to be different both both from QSR as well as the more, you know, the, the premium sandwich shops that are opening up today. You know, I still have yet to see the hat, which you keep talking about. Um, you have the hat. I mean, the hat really exists, right? I mean, there is a hat. <laughs> There's the hat, everybody. <laughs> That looks really good on you, Rob. This is the most expensive uh, piece of attire in my wardrobe. I can assure you of that. You're going to pin that on Pinterest as, you know, like under like your closet or style. That's really sweet. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing that um, it fits over top of the, uh, the the wonderful headphones that my friend <laughs> sent me here. <laughs> it makes you look like you have a very tall head. Yeah, I think it, you know, it, it did the same for Pharrell and it worked for him. So I'm going to go with it. <laughs> you look, you look styling. I, I, I think, yeah. um, I think that's a good look for you. Your kids well, will love it. One thing I can tell you is that, um, it's hard to wear this hat and not feel happy. <laughs> I love that. Um, yeah. yeah, well, I can't not hear the song and not feel happy. So... I was so, so touched too when Oprah interviewed him and he cried. Like that was like amazing. Um, you know, I've, we've got a couple of other people that are going to be joining us for the show. Certainly you're welcome to stick around, Rob, um, and uh, join the marketing and branding conversation. Great. Good. Well, I, I will, but I, I'm, I'm, you're okay if I remove the hat at this <laughs> point because uh, I don't know. it's actually a quite warm hat. So <laughs> is it really? I don't know how Pharrell did, you know, the whole routine up on stage wearing this hat because it, it, it definitely keeps your head warm. <laughs> Somebody said Smokey the Bear. So there's lots of questions. You're making the um, the chat room quite hungry, myself included. Fortunately, we've got a big table back there of all kinds of Arby's stuff. Um, we've got a couple of people joining us uh, now for a little bit more debate and conversation around marketing topics that we find kind of interesting or not. Um, and some ideas that we think that brands are doing great. We've got... Uh, Lynette Young joining us and Bob Norp. Bob Norp of Dean Cast and Lynette Young. Um, what's uh, what's the name of your business there, Lynette? You, it's Purple. Purple Stripe Productions. Purple Stripe. Because my hair used to be purple. It did. Yeah. But it looks and your room's purple too. Look at all that purple. There's a lot of purple <laughs> going on over there. I'm What's very going? niche with my color. Very niche. <laughs> we need to get you a purple hat made. Yes, I agree. <laughs> Oy vey. Uh, you heard it here first, folks. Arby's is going to give her a purple hat. <laughs> what? I need a hat. Uh, I don't. I don't like getting hats. So, okay, we we talked a lot, a little bit about social media, specifically Twitter, and what um, what you did at Arby's, which I thought was very funny, and was capitalized on a moment and brought attention to your brand. And I think there's this idea, and it was around the Grammys, which um, we had Evan Green on last week talking about how the Grammys uses social media every year. The first year they used it, they had a 35% increase in Nielsen ratings, 34% with tweens. They still use it. They're still seeing uh, a lot of people, you know, second screeners using social media, using Twitter, using Facebook, and then pushing them into the traditional TV audience, which I'm a cord cutter. So, you know, that's a little bit of a, always a disadvantage for me because I want to be able to see it. And, you know, not everything is on Hulu and Netflix. So including the Grammys. Um, but, you know, there was a, a, NBC came out and said, um, and I think Bob, you even covered this a little bit on the Beancast, but yeah. this idea <laughs> that yeah, that the NBC didn't come out. An NBC researcher was interviewed, so NBC go. is distancing themselves from this statement. You know, <laughs> I have no idea why this statement came out, but you know, it is an NBC researcher who said this. But it's okay. So it's an NBC researcher, and it basically the exec said um, that Twitter doesn't drive sales; it doesn't drive an audience. 
And I, they're basing that on the Olympics, which is one event. Um, but I think, you know, we see brands over and over again saying that's quite different. The Grammys is just one of those. And even, uh, Rob, you commented that, you know, that clearly brought a lot of attention. Just that one tweet brought a lot of attention to your brand in a positive way and helped people hear maybe the message that you have healthier menu options and you're more than just a roast beef sandwich, although that's probably your, I'm guessing your most popular product. What would you say about that, um, Bob? I mean, and happy birthday, by the way. Oh, thank you very much. You know, this 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 report is so bizarre. When you think about it, uh, you know, what he's really saying is that, it, that Twitter's not driving any new audience to the programming. He's not saying that it's not effective. He's not saying that it's not driving sales. He's just saying that it's not driving new audience. And he's using only one particular event, an event that is worldwide awareness already, already has 100 billion people watching around the globe. And, you know, of course it's not going to be driving new audience. Everybody's aware of the Olympics already. And then, of course, you know, the, the comment that it's driving, uh, that, that the programming is actually driving more Twitter interactions as opposed to the converse. Uh, you know, yeah, in that one situation, you're probably right. But, you know, it, it, it's, it's, you know, that claim seems to me it's more about some kind of negotiation tactic because, you know, Twitter is trying to do deals with the broadcast nets. And, you know, when, like, for instance, since the selfie during the Oscars. Uh, that selfie was paid for by the Oscars. The Oscars had to pay Twitter to be the official selfie social network. Um, you know, they're trying to do deals all the time with the social networks as they, they go forward. And I think this is mainly about trying to be a negotiation ploy. Would you say that's Lynette? Because I mean, look, we talked about Nielsen and the fact that Nielsen came out with a study, I think last August, mm -hmm. that really says, yeah, absolutely. Your, your second screen is driving traffic back to traditional television. And, you know, that's how I found out 24 was going to be on again. No spoilers, please, because I haven't seen right. it yet. But, you know, I'm a big fan of 24 and I wanted to know, does Jack Bauer still use Sprint? You know, <laughs> but as the world turns, that's 24. OK, we're, we're pretty yeah. much covered. We got it. Are you guys a fan of 24? Well, silence. You know, watch it, well, yeah. you know, they, they had a couple good seasons of nerve gas attacks, and that's about it. <laughs> I have to avoid social media because I don't want to know what's going to happen. But, but that's how yeah. we find out about a lot of the the you know shows that are out there. The I think second screen is a really big part of that. What's your approach towards mobile, Rob? I mean, how are you guys thinking about mobile or the second screen experience? You know, we're in a uh, industry that I consider to be. A mobile industry. I mean, you know, folks are who come into our restaurants are out and about and, and do you know running their their lives. Uh, whether it's you know uh, taking a break for lunch or going to pick up the family <clears throat> and needing a solution while you're out on the road. So mobile for for me, I think presents a whole new uh, medium of connecting and communicating with our customers in two ways. And, you know, Bob, you, you mentioned awareness. You know, I think any marketer um, always wants to drive awareness and engagement, right? And so I think you need to pick and choose when it's the right time for awareness and when it's the right time for engagement. And for us, um, we want to drive a lot of awareness um, between 11 and one o'clock in the afternoon. And a lot of our customers sure. aren't sitting in front of TVs during that time. So our ability to target them and reach them in real time with um, relevant and compelling options that meet their needs while they're out and about doing whatever it is they're doing is, is a platform that we never really had before outside of you know a billboard or something like that. So. Um, mobile for us, and I think mobile for this industry is is will become one of the most important um, marketing platforms that we we leverage to interact and engage with our customers. What would you say to that, Lynette? I mean, you you deal with, especially with a lot of small to medium sized businesses about um, you know their strategy. How important is mobile to the small business? You know, it's funny because even looking at this NBC slash Olympics, you know mess that they got themselves into and kind of I always look to the big names and to the big mistakes to see where you can trickle it on down. I've been seeing a lot of um, small to medium type businesses 
whether you gauge it by headcount or rev, you know yearly revenue, that have skipped a lot of things and are now jumping right over to mobile. Um, they're not necessarily trying to play catch up and and do the things that the bigger companies and the bigger brands did three to five years ago. They're just going. We really have to figure this out now. But sadly, I think that the, a lot of them are failing. I've not really seen any really great um, case studies come out of it because they don't have the cumulative experience going forward of what worked, what didn't work. They're just trying to jump in right now, and it makes it very difficult. And the big brands haven't figured a mobile out completely yet. Um, and Twitter, to me, is a very mobile platform. Um, yeah, you can use it on your computer, but most people are using it from their mobile devices Um even laptops, I kind of consider that mobile a little bit, even for the second screen experience, because that's what I do, because I want more battery life than I could get out of my tablet. Um, so I've been seeing a lot of companies try to jump over, and it's just it's just not working yet on the, on the small business side. So Facebook has formally um, launched its uh, in-app mobile ad network. They're really focusing on that. They realized, you know... Um, that mobile needed to be something they focused more on. They're, they're, they're certainly making attempts to do that and engaging businesses and, and brands to, just to tell them, you know, hey, we're, we're better at this. What would you say to that, um, Bob? I mean, what, what do you think of Facebook's um, strategy that targets the rest of the mobile world? Well, everybody's got to be thinking about mobile. I mean, you know, because let, let's face it, we're, we're talking about going mobile, but the fact is we've got the internet in our pocket at this point, and, and mobile is the first screen. Uh, we, we talk about multi-screen strategies, but when it comes down to it, mobile is the first screen for most people to interact with each other, um, to... Uh, you know, basically to get any kind of communication. I mean, you know, we talk about Facebook and we talk about the, the mobile ad network that they're trying to develop. I mean, this is just a, uh, a survival play on their part. I mean, they need to be on the mobile device. They understand the importance of the mobile device. Um, you know, most people are interacting in Facebook on mobile devices. They understand that, you know, they need to be involved with all the different apps that are on the desktop and they need to be serving ads on all those other experiences because that's how people are getting their internet overall. You know, one of the interesting aspects of this story that a lot of people are overlooking is that Facebook is starting to split out the apps and, and forcing people to, you know, interact on a bunch of different platforms. And it's, it's, it comes down to, a, you know, a typical retail strategy. Because when you do a retail, you know, if you go deep on a shelf, you're, but you become invisible to the consumer as they walk down the aisles. But if you go wide on the shelf, then suddenly you're very, you have a lot of presence. I mean, people are seeing you, people are interacting with your brand. And that, that's essentially what they're trying to do with this ad network and with the app strategy that they're trying to put together. They're, they're essentially trying to go wide on the desktop of the mobile device and own that desktop so that people will see Facebook and have experience with Facebook and, and Facebook will dominate the entire mobile platform. Uh, that's what it's all about. Uh, it's about being wide on that desktop and having lots of different apps. I mean, you, you've heard recently, Tanya, right? I mean, you know, in the next update to Facebook, they're going to disable the the chat function in the main app and force you to use the Facebook Messenger. Um, that's, that's not a mistake here. This is not um, uh, an accident on their part. I mean, they're actually just trying to dominate the desktop. And you know, I have to say, I don't really like the Facebook chat feature myself, but, um, but you know, I do think Facebook's actually desperately trying to do some things different um, that they think is going to help uh, encourage people back. So what would you say to that, Lynette? I mean, do you encourage your clients to advertise on Facebook? Is it important for small businesses? For small, local, like brick and mortar businesses, yes, just because of the targeting that they can get. But if they have to go wide, I'm saying no, honestly. Um, anything wide, meaning maybe more than a, you know, out of a metro area. If you're going to be Philadelphia and New York and Chicago and Atlanta, unless you can actually spin all those plates locally at the same time, um, I'm always usually saying no, you know, based on who they are exactly. I'm waiting for, I don't really feel like mobile advertising with the focus on Facebook is going to work until people figure out how to package the advertising better. Um, I don't want to see a 30 second spot. I don't necessarily want to see a sponsored post. I want, I'm a much bigger fan of neighbor, native advertising. I want to see things blend in a bit more. I want to see other people's opinions put in there, not just some 
you know, photoshopped picture for some diet pill showing up on my phone at, at you know, well, bad well, times. It's, it's, they're taking the same stuff that they tried to shove on the desktop and shove it into a smaller screen. And I just don't think it's working. I think they need to reinvent the medium of which the advertising comes in. And until that, I really just see it as shoving commercials on a phone. Let me let me ask you a question, Lynette. Though I mean, when we're we're talking about the Facebook ad network, what they're really trying to do is sell the targeting and the data and the ability to take all that and export that to other applications around the uh, around the desktop. I mean, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, the, there's a big problem with display. There's a big problem with the way mm -hmm. that we're serving the ads. But, you know, the targeting is very valuable. So don't you see that there's ongoing value in having a network that does that, that takes all this rich social data, um, lays it over top of the demographics and the targeting, and then gives you the access to an entire network of applications all across the phone? There's such a misstep, though, yeah. a missed opportunity, I think, too, when you think about um, capturing this data and and really serving it back to the customer. You know, I see constantly people talk about being, um, you know, served ads that are completely inappropriate for them. That oh, don't that get me started on this, Tanya. Don't <laughs> get me started on this. My God, you know, <laughs> this use, I mean, let's face it, we're, we're, we're using permissions and we're using the data that we have, this big data archive, purely to find opportunities to market to people, as opposed to trying to understand the consumer and market to them smarter. I, you know, we, we talk about blanket permissions. What we're basically asking people to do is like, will you, you know, do we have permission to send you more email in your email box? Or do we have the permission to give you more banners and, and clutter up your desktop? Why not learn about the consumer and give them much more contextually based advertisements that are, are that are seamless, that that are assuring people of the privacy, that are recognizing, you know, what they would like to see and what they don't like to see? Yeah. You know what, Bob, I think you hit it right there. Just like Rob had mentioned before about when he, you know, when you, when you first went into Arby's, the first thing you did was want to go out there and talk to people about their perceptions of what your brand were. I don't, we, a lot of us talk about all of this data that we can derive out of um, behaviors of customers online. And we only use that as marketers to narrow down the targeting that we do rather than go the other way and figure out maybe we're offering the wrong product. Maybe we're really not supposed to be marketing to this segment. We should be going over here. I never see the data flow the other way. Never see it happen. Rob, what would you say about that? I mean, you know, contextual targeting is great. Um, there's a lot of data. We use the term big data a lot. How important is the data to, to Arby's? How do you approach the kind of content um, message that you get from the data and, and push it and push your message out to educate people? Well, you know, we're, we're, we're getting more sophisticated um, very quickly because we have to. I mean, as I mentioned, We've been kind of a broad-based appeal uh, brand for a long time. Anyone who wants a roast beef sandwich while they're out and about comes to Arby's, right? But as we continue to build innovation that is different and that may not appeal to that core customer who comes in for a roast beef sandwich, let's just say, you know, a jalapeno turkey sandwich or something. Our roast, our core roast beef customer isn't going to want that product, but there may be a lot of high potential customers who do. And so our ability to be very precise in who we target with what message allows us to be um, still stay true to ourselves and who we want to be holistically, but allow us to offer um, catered and unique experiences for individual people that we know are going to be excited about that, but not turn off the people who have come to us for, you know, our traditional products for a long time. So that, that knowledge, that ability to discern between different customer segments and target them with different messages and different products is kind of the essence of marketing and what we have, you know, I think been working towards for a long, long time. And all the data that we now have access to allows us to do that. I mean, you guys mentioned Facebook. I met with Facebook two weeks ago. And really, um, it was just a, a super interesting conversation about how much knowledge they have of everybody in their system and how they're able to uniquely give, you know, targeted messages to unique people. So they will obviously won't share that data with us. 
But, that's the biggest um, thing I've heard ever, all the stuff that they know about us. I mean, that's, you know, that's the way Google and Facebook, they know everything about us. Isn't yeah. that scary? The Google <laughs> you know, knows everything. The Google knows everything. It's, it, well, tell, tell me, Rob, I mean, you know, from a permission standpoint, don't you find permissions to be frustrating? Because, you know, you're essentially, you've got this permission to market to people, yet you also have all this data that's telling you things like, um, like maybe this person is giving you permission to market to them, but they never post pictures of their kids on Facebook. And Facebook knows this, you know, Facebook knows that, you know, uh, between the data from Google and Facebook and all the customer data that you're getting from third parties, you know that this person has three kids, but they never post pictures. So why not, why are we not telling them, you know, we're going to protect your privacy and never market to you about kids stuff? You know, it, it, it's so frustrating to just have this blanket permission and then piss the customer off on an ongoing basis because, you know, we have this data, but we don't have the data scientists to unwrap it and give us the the more you know insightful looks at what we're supposed to be saying to the consumer. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, you use that you use the term, you know, piss the customer off and that that is absolutely you, know, you do that so many too many times and all of a sudden you lose affinity for your brand, you lose loyalty. So I think it's about respect. I think it's about respecting their desire to only have stuff that's meaningful and relevant. To them, and I, I think that's where a lot of you know, email could have been a great marketing platform, but it was so abused in the sense that all of a sudden everyone started getting 87 emails in their inbox every day that weren't relevant, didn't mean anything to them, weren't useful to them. So one of the key um, challenges that I give to my team here is to make sure that we don't send out, even if even if it seems like it may be a good idea, we may get some coverage or we may get some pickup from the media or we may get a couple extra customers. We really have to pick and choose where we enter into their lives and where we enter into the conversations. Because if you enter in too many times when you're not relevant or you're not engaging, they, they, they start to tune you out. So um, more is not always better. And that's why the data allows us to be more precise in how we market and who we market to. And that's why I think um, these platforms, social and, and, and mobile, are going to be so compelling as we move forward. I would agree. And I think, you know, it, it's actually using, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of data out there. The Google has it. Facebook has it. Um, but I don't think as brands we're successfully utilizing it. And I talked about being served up ads on Facebook that have nothing to do with me. Like, or I, I looked at this product three years ago. I don't need it anymore, but I still get served up ads. Somebody's paying for it, right? So Lynette, what, what do you think is wrong with the Facebook um, advertise. What do they need to do differently to help serve um, ads to us better and make us more receptive? Well, you know, like just the way you phrased it, like how how should Facebook help us serve ads better? Facebook has the data and they allow us to do what we do. Um, bad marketing is the part that we're seeing. Um, you know, I Sister, amen. <laughs> It's not the it's not the technology, it's not the platform, it's not the data, it's the marketing that stinks. It's that middleman or woman that goes in there. I met um, some years ago, right before I turned forty, so it was very relevant to me at the time. Um, someone that does like um, all the the beauty surgeries and all that kind of thing, and he said basically, if you are a woman on Facebook within two hundred and fifty miles of me that's forty or over that just changed their marital status, I will market to you. I don't care. If you also say you have cancer, like literally, this is what he told me, I will market to you anyway to get a liposuction and to get a boob job or whatever. And he just had no regard and he spent probably $10,000 a month at that time on advertising and it was offensive to a lot of people. I mean, he would wind up getting phone calls at the office and things like he didn't care. He's like, for the ones that go through, it's fine. So it was just this spray and pray that he had hold of this data that he misused. So I see just because you have it doesn't mean you should do it. And I still see that with a lot of people, just because you're in a zip code or just because you bought one product means you're going to buy this. And it's just not an appropriate thing. I'm more into the not permission-based marketing, but restricted-based marketing, more like your, here's the pool of people we should be picking from. Now let's find every reason we can to make that pool of people smaller. Because okay. when you do that, you're narrowing in them, them more. 
the technology allows us as marketers to do some really stupid things. I don't think that this is Facebook's problem to, or to fix, so to speak. I think it's the people in the middle. I think it's the marketers need to learn to control themselves and to, to focus a little bit more. So let's one talk of, about one, of the, one, of the, one of the misnomers of advertising that I, I just it drives me crazy. When someone says banner ads don't work, banner ads suck, you know, it, it, everybody, that's a mantra. I mean, we say it. We say it all the time. It's like 0.03% response. That's terrible. Blah, 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 blah. You know, it, what it is is there's a lot of people doing really, really bad banner advertisements, just like there's a lot of people doing really, really bad direct marketing. It doesn't yeah. make it less effective. It just makes it that there's a lot of people out there driving the average down. And, and another thing to keep in mind is, you know, for years, the brand marketers would talk about um, direct marketing and say, oh, you got that 0.3% response, you know, take that to the bank. And, you know, you just turn around and you go, well, prove to me what kind of value you're getting from that, you know, that, that TV spot. I mean, you know, Nielsen ratings, you know, the buzz ratings, I mean, you know, that 3% response translates into a million dollars of profit. You know, that means something that means something to the, to, to the marketer. So, you you know, when you talk to the banner ad people, you know, the, the, the ad serving people who are doing it right, some of them are still getting five and 10 and sometimes up to 20% response rates and generating amazing conversions because they figured out the end to end thing and they've kept it very mobile optimized and they've done all their homework. I mean, there are a lot of very, very effective, well-targeted, well-executed online marketing campaigns, and it's just being lost because we're so busy talking about the bad campaigns that are not effective, the, well, the ones that are targeting you incorrectly. Yeah, and, and that's like, and I, and even getting into the, you know, you brought up mobile and, and ad, ads and apps. I mean, there's a whole another show conversation there. I want to switch gears just a little bit and talk about Amazon carts. We're going to talk about poise, right? <laughs> no, not yet. No. I don't know. <laughs> I'll give you an opportunity for that. 40. Amazon cart, really? I mean, and, and you know, I don't think Twitter is actually getting, uh, according to Amazon, any revenue from this. So why Amazon cart? Are you going to really put things in your cart and publicly let everybody know what you're shopping for? I mean, what do you think about that, Lynette? <laughs> this thing that I thought. <laughs> okay, I'm going to let Lynette <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and that's like I'm looking at it from a technical aspect of how mechanically is this going to work? Um, you know, I kind of like it. I can see the affiliate marketers jumping all over this. That was the first thing that came to mind. If the, I still have to research it further to see if they'll allow affiliate links to be shared like that and then thrown into carts if, if that um, link still processes through. Um, I do like it. I, I can think of a lot of places where it would be applicable. I can also see where it could run amok. First of all, I'm not going, I, the, the Amazon cart hashtag is in a response to something. It's not like I necessarily even have to tweet a link. If, I'm, if I already have the Amazon link, I might as well just click and buy it. Um, it's more of a promotion item that other people that follow me on Twitter might say, yeah, I thought that was a cool, you know, computer case too. I'll buy it. Um, so it's more that that kind of uh, transaction that's going on. Um, but I think that if you're going to respond and publicly to like, say, whatever we may deem, not inappropriate, but just more risky type things like, I don't know, adult toys or whatever people could sell on Amazon that you wouldn't want the public to do. I don't think that that's going to work so much, but I can see it being more in conjunction with um, uh, people's opinions and reviews and things like that saying, I just did a blog post on this. I reviewed this product. Here's the Amazon link. It, you know, without even reading the blog post or anything, if you're interested, they could just kind of throw it into their cart. Um, I do like the idea of skipping the desktop to get this done, uh, to make purchases. But I, my biggest concern is if I respond with the hashtag and they've already tweeted another link, am I going to put the wrong thing into my cart? Is affiliate sales, because that's, you know, a, a sizable uh, piece of Amazon as well. Does it work with Kindle books? Like, I want to know more about it before I think that I'm going to say, yeah, this is a really cool idea. I think it's gimmicky. I don't think it's going to work very well. Amazon hasn't changed their website um, and their product listings to reflect any of this yet. Their share tweet button is really tiny and off to the side. So it looks a little half-hearted to me right now. And candidly, how that works is, so um, use that use a hashtag, the number sign, Amazon cart on Twitter. So you have to be on Twitter. You have to see something that you like. If you use that 
hashtag, it actually puts something in your cart for Amazon to buy, which I think certainly there's opportunity talking about data to gather more information and be more specific with what things that people are talking about, what works on Twitter, what people are buying. But you, you know, birthday boy, Rob, Bob, uh, you wanted to jump in there. What do you have to think about that? You know, this is, this is a purely a PR effort on the part of Twitter and on part of Amazon. Amazon gets to look cool and innovative because they're doing something on social media. Twitter gets to prove that they're a competitor to Pinterest and an e-commerce platform where e-commerce can actually get done. Neither of which is true. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. You know, it's, it's all about the PR value. You know, nobody's going to be tweeting about, uh, I mean, t tweeting to Amazon, I'm going to buy a TV. You know, it, it, why would you do that? I, it's just like, you know, you maybe one or two people will and they'll get the PR value out of it. But, you know, mass people or the, the mass audience is not going to be tweeting about the fact that they're buying TVs or that they need more toilet paper or whatever. They're just going to go to Amazon on the Amazon app and do it and, and, and buy it. Uh, it's the easiest thing for people to do. This is mainly about... Um, adding a layer of convenience, nobody loses in this um, scenario because Amazon, even if they get 100 people to do it, that's 100 more sales that they've made more convenient. Uh, it doesn't have to be, there's no infrastructure to invest in this. You know, all you have to do is have a little sync, you know, you know, sync up your transaction system with Twitter and, and, and you're good to go. I mean, that it, it's, it's a no lose situation. You know, why not do it? Bob, you're my favorite because you said Pinterest. And we actually almost made it through the entire show without the mention of Pinterest, but I love Pinterest, so. <laughs> <laughs> I am. So are you on Pinterest, Rob? I know Arby's is. You guys have uh, several boards and all kinds of Arby's Say uh, no, Rob. Products. Say no. Say you're not on Pinterest. Say no. <laughs> <laughs> I do have an account. I have to say it uh, hasn't been used in quite some time. It's Yay! A, same here. Uh, seriously? i got a couple of your pages. <laughs> Lynette. I Pinterest, shop are you from a pinner? Pinterest. Well, I'm a I'm a passive user of it. I'm not a, I'm not a power user personally on the platform at all. But I bought stuff from Pinterest. Absolutely. I think I'm going to get my uh, my next Arby sandwich delivered via drone. Is that on the marketing plan, Rob? <laughs> well, you know, we are really exploring uh, the whole mobile ordering and and how we can be more effective and and more efficient by using the platform. Um, you know, no one is really doing it right today. I think a lot of people are dipping their toes in the water and trying to figure it out. But I do think it is the next wave for our industry. Um, mob the more mobile we can get, the more we can be more convenient for our customers. And, you know, there's every QSR, you know, uh, restaurant will tell you that the goal is to be, you know, great, have great food, great value, great convenience. So mobile, mobile kind of taps into... Um, the value and the convenience play, and we're we're right now working on how we execute it at Arby's. In in your honor, Bob, since it's your birthday, it's your birthday, it's your birthday. Um, I'm going to ask each one of you a question it's that nice. that Bob nice. likes to ask. You sing the happy birthday song. You know, you didn't, <laughs> didn't hey, rack hey, up it's another. It's copyrighted. You can't do it. Yeah, I know. I can't. You charge. <laughs> I can't. That's crazy. Well, but I can't. I, there's other birthday songs I can sing, um, and I would. Um, so in, in, in being cast Bob Norb style, um, Lynette, what is something you're watching right now? What's the story that's important to you? Oh, um, you know what? I was curious on the, um, Amazon one. That's kind of why, why I brought it up before on a technical basis. I'm just waiting for people to order things by accident and, and kind of do it that way. But, you know, unknowing that, you know, we were going to be talking to Arby's today. I'm watching this, um, th this kind of course of micro niche marketing of I have uh, local professional friends that you know only want to develop marketing plans for restaurants or for dry cleaners or for that type of brick and mortar the smaller um, type of companies that have jumped over a lot of this other stuff that we've been doing for the past decade and um, you know write marketing plans and develop plans just for them and the small companies and the mom and pops seem to be going for it. So rather than doing this big, broad, wide sweeping marketing idea with digital, um, they're really going deep and going niche. So I'm curious to see how that's going to work out. And if somebody wants to connect with you, maybe they want to talk to you more about some of these really interesting topics or just follow you on social media, what's the best way they can do that? Uh, Twitter's probably easiest at Lynette Radio and Google Plus is kind of my thing too. So uh, plus Lynette Young over there. 
Yeah, I wanted to talk with you a little bit about. We'll have to have you come back on and talk about Google Plus and 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 more about the Google. But uh, thanks, thanks for coming on. And okay, Bob, for you, what are you watching? You know, I'm I'm really fascinated with what happened during the new fronts. For those of you in the audience who don't know about the new fronts, it's basically um, the upfronts is are the way that all the ad deals get done for the year for the broadcast and the cable networks. They they trot out their big new shows. The media agencies and the brands come line up, watch the new shows, watch the big pitches, and make their ad commitments for the year. The new fronts are the digital equivalent to that. And, you know, during the new fronts this year, YouTube really came into its own in a big way because for the first time, I think a lot of brands and a lot of marketers are looking at YouTube not as a stepping stone for, you know, potential news stars that they can sponsor, but a place, a destination where stars are made and entire brands are being formed. And there's great marketing partnership opportunities, not just places to run pre-roll ads. So um, it's really fascinating. I think a lot of brands had their eyes opened up during the new fronts this year. And it's going to be interesting to see how it translates into marketing spend over the next two years. And if somebody wants to follow you, connect with you, or hear more about what you're doing, how can they do that? There are a couple of ways to do that, Tanya. Uh, you can go to thebeancast.com. That's the home of the Beancast Marketing Podcast. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can go to Bob Norp. That's Bob, K-N-O-R-P-P, -P, or the Beancast. Uh, either Twitter handle is fine for me, and I'll, I'll get in touch with you. And Rob, um, what can we expect to see from you, and what are you watching? Uh, I, you know, we just talked about mobile. I am intently watching how uh, our industry rolls out our mobile platforms and how they execute it at the restaurant level. So that is incredibly high on my radar screen. Um, the other thing that's high on my radar screen is a lot less sophisticated is the weather. Uh, this year, our, you know, our industry is I never thought that my career would be dependent upon weather patterns, but um you know, our, our business has been really impacted by the, the, oh the God, weather right. this Isn't year. That, that's horrible. The weather will totally kill QSR, won't it? <laughs> it does. It does. It goes up and down. So uh, I've never, I've, I've become a bit of an amateur meteorologist. So uh, that's been very exciting. Um, but yeah, if you, if you want to reach out to Arby's or, or learn a little bit more about what we're doing, as I mentioned earlier in the podcast or in the, in the show that we, um, we, you know, track every conversation. So you can tweet right at us, at Arby's, and, and we will be listening. When can we expect drone delivery of Arby's roast beef sandwiches? When can I expect my Arby's delivery today? That's what I'm wondering <laughs> about. I don't care about the drones, and I don't care about anything. And when am I going to get my headset, Tanya? I want a headset. You have to come to the brick house, Bob, next time <laughs> you're in the area. demanding. He is demanding. Bob, you have to join the uh, Junior Astronauts Club to get one of these headsets. Uh, how about the Arby's? Do I have to do I have to like join the club? <laughs> do I have to wear a hat to get this? And if I wear a hat, will I get Arby's? <laughs> I want the hat. Well, I really appreciate all of you guys joining us and talking about your insights in marketing. And uh, Rob, thanks for taking time out of making the roast beef sandwiches that we all love so much and, and all of your other healthy menu items. We've certainly got um, a table in our lunchroom full of, uh, there's a picture of it right there, of all of the Arby's. Uh, that that were delivered. There's, there's. I'm gonna totally like blow my diet today. But you know what? It's for a good cause. And and there's some healthy stuff out there. I want to try that uh, pecan chicken salad sandwich. Yum. Beef and cheddar. There's nothing better than the beef and cheddar. <laughs> gotta love that beef and cheddar thing. Course, Everybody's got a favorite. It, there the you go. The chicken salad is good with the grapes. Mmm, very well, good. Everyone, thank you so much for joining, and um, we appreciate your time. Thank you, Tanya. Thanks, Tanya. Absolutely. So um, that's another episode of Marketing Mavericks. And you can actually connect with the show by following me on Twitter at, at Tanya Hall Radio, which I know I need to change to TV. And uh, you can also use the hashtag Marketing Mavericks. We'll be love to hear from you. We've had a lot of suggestions of who we should have on the show. And you know what? I'm listening and I will be inviting some of those people. And you can also uh, contact me on Facebook. You can uh, join our Google Plus page at Marketing Mavericks. Yep, we're everywhere. We're all over social media. So that wraps another episode and we'll talk to you next Tuesday. Bye.